Welcome to episode 23 of the Cancer Pod. In this episode, we're talking about bowel changes. Why do they happen and what causes them? I'm Dr. Tina Kayser, and as Leah likes to say, I'm the sciencey one. And I'm Dr. Leah Sherman, and I'm the Cancer Insider. And we're two naturopathic doctors who practice integrative cancer care. But we're not your doctors. This is for education, entertainment, and informational purposes only. Do not apply any of this information without first speaking to your doctor. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast by the hosts and their guests are solely their own. Welcome to the Cancer Pod. Hey, Tina. Hi, Leah. We're talking about poop today. Yes, today and for the next few episodes. These are our poop episodes. <laughs> That's right. This is a really important subject because bowel changes, whether it's diarrhea or constipation, those can affect how your treatment is administered. Yeah, yeah. We do talk about stool changes in everyone's bowel function at every appointment. Throughout treatment. Yeah. And beyond. Pretty much if you're going to see a naturopathic doctor, expect to talk about poo. Yeah. And, you know, if you have an animal, you watch their poop and assess their health. If you have a child, you're changing diapers. I mean, you, you, you do know, everyone knows, everyone knows that watching changes in stool can signify, you know, what's going on internally. So, And then you throw cancer and cancer treatment into the mix. And I mean, the whole thing just goes out the window. I mean, it's just, you know, yeah, what's going to happen? What day? I mean, it really, it becomes unpredictable. So that's our first episode that we're going to talk about why these bowel changes happen. Um, you know, why is it important, mm -hmm. especially during treatment mm -hmm. to manage it? And then, you know, if, if symptoms persist afterwards, you know, you know, why that can happen. And then we'll go into more of the details in the next two episodes. Yes. We'll dedicate a whole episode on constipation and then a whole episode on diarrhea, loose stools. All right. So shall we start with function? Yeah. Let's talk about, let's talk about um, like what, what do our bowels do? You know, how is poop made? Yeah. So I'm going to start at the very top because I know we're going to talk about bowels, but, you know, I like to put everything in, into context. So as soon as you start eating, you start digesting. There are enzymes found in your saliva that start to break down carbohydrates. Then you swallow that food. The first third of your esophagus you're in charge of. The last two thirds is involuntary. That just kind of goes through a, a wave process to push the food down into your stomach. And once it's in your stomach, that's where acid is secreted, right? And pepsin. But without going into too much detail, the acidity of the stomach is important because that sets up the rest of the cascade for digestion. So if your stomach acid is adequate and it's very acidic, it's much more acidic than, say, vinegar. It's extremely acidic. It's a pH of, say, 2. It dumps into your small intestine, the very first part of your small intestine, which is called your duodenum or duodenum, depending where you live. And that duodenum is where your bile acids come in and your pancreatic juices go in. So the more robust your digestion, the more enzymes that are secreted by your pancreas and a good amount of bile is secreted from your gallbladder. Bile is made in the liver, sits in the gallbladder waiting for you to eat. Your gallbladder contracts and sends out a bolus of bile to help you digest that food when it hits the small intestine. Pancreatic enzymes, same thing, come out in a big bolus because there's a signal that goes to your pancreas and says there's food here. So while that's going on, there's also enzymes produced by the small intestine itself. So the small intestine makes enzymes. So you have the pancreas making enzymes, which I think most people are familiar with. Your saliva actually has some enzymes, and you get some enzymes from your first segment of the small intestine. They're called brush border enzymes, and that is required to break down some of the carbohydrates as well. And then onward, it goes down the small intestine. From the small intestine, it enters into the large intestine, which is also called the colon, through the ileocecal valve. And that's the area where the appendix also is. In any case, when it enters into the colon, it is the consistency of a milkshake. 
And then by the time it goes through the colon and the water is absorbed into your system, it comes out as a solid or semi-solid. I think that's a really good explanation, you know, especially towards the end, because it kind of sets you up for seeing, you know, like how diarrhea can happen, right? Because if it enters the large intestine with a milkshake consistency and it comes out the rectum with a milkshake consistency, there's not absorption going on. As you were saying this, I just kept thinking about all of the surgeries that patients have. So that could lead us into, you know, why the treatments can cause bowel changes. And so let's start with surgery first, because you just, you just created that visual. So if there are any surgeries that affect that small intestine, the gallbladder, the pancreas, you know, and the large intestine, there can be bowel issues that follow. Yeah, that is a good place to start because even as the patient tries to understand what's going on, it's good to find out exactly what has been resected or removed so that you can then understand functionally what has been removed. Yeah, because I've had a number of patients who have had gallbladder surgeries, whether it was prior to a cancer diagnosis or as a result of you know one of their cancer surgeries, their gallbladder was removed and they had bowel changes afterwards and they never met with a dietitian. They never had met with anyone who talked to them about this could be a potential consequence of having this surgery. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. I think it's I think it's important if there has been any intervention at all along the GI tract and there's bowel changes to rule that out as a possible cause. Or any sort of surgery where the large intestine is affected or shortened, um, that brings a whole new dynamic into managing bowels. Right, because without the six feet of length of the colon, if it's shortened for any reason, then you're going to not absorb the water as readily or as well. Right. And so that that requires a little bit more management, which we're not necessarily going to go into here, but um, hopefully some of the tips that we we talk about can be helpful. So that's the surgery summary. Um, chemotherapy. Chemotherapy, we've mentioned this before. I mean, this is what causes the the mouth sores that happen part of the digestive tract. You have rapidly dividing cells. You know, that's that affects, like you were mentioning, like the the brush border enzymes, like anything that replicates quickly, including cancer cells, but it's also those, you know, it's the collateral damage that can happen with chemotherapies. And some more than others. So if someone's getting a chemotherapy and diarrhea is listed as a side effect, and it's going to be listed for most of them, but it for some of them, it's nearly 100%, right? So very few people don't get diarrhea with certain drugs. So learning about that and how to manage it beforehand is is really important. Yeah. So some of the drugs that I think of are like cisplatin is mm-hmm. is a big one for bowel changes. Arinitecan is infamous for bowel changes. Um, vincristine, mm-hmm. the ta- some of the taxanes. Oh, and then the AC of, you know, the adriamycin and the cytoxin that a lot of patients get for breast cancer. Those also are notorious. Um, the 5-FU family, mm-hmm. you know, capecitabine and, and 5-FU itself. Gemcitabine, which is often for pancreatic cancer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, there, there are these, these families and, you know, they, they have different effects on the body. And so they can either cause, you know, that's, what's so confusing. It's like, you know, because a patient will ask, oh, am I going to get diarrhea or constipation? And it's like, the answer could be yes. Yeah. <laughs> Cause you're not quite sure how, which way it'll go. Like you're saying, you know, it's not necessarily like, oh, you're getting a, and your result is going to be B it's like, it could be B or C. Right, right. And a lot of these drugs require a steroid, like dexamethasone, alongside when they get the infusion. If that's the case, dexamethasone does tend to constipate people. So it could be changing from constipation to diarrhea in the matter of days or a week, easily. Yeah. And, you know, other other treatments, you know, the targeted therapies, for some people, they can be a lot less side effects, but bowel changes still can happen. Um, diarrhea would be a big one. And then diarrhea also can happen with immunotherapy because some patients get colitis, which is an inflammation of the colon. Yeah, yeah. Colitis is pretty common with those immunotherapies like those uh, Optivo, Keytruda. They're being advertised on the nightly news these days. And it has to be managed very differently than than 
any other diarrhea we're talking about because that's the, actually the immune system being turned on and attacking your own colon. In the process of turning on the immune system to kill the cancer cells, a cross-reaction happens, and that is an, more of an autoimmune process. So that has to be managed aggressively by the by the medical team. Yeah, and so maybe I, I was going to talk about the next treatment, but maybe we jump into the the toxicity criteria for both diarrhea and constipation. Yeah. So grade one diarrhea is considered an increase of less than four stools per day over the baseline. So over what normally happens with the patient's you know bowel habits. Grade two is an increase of four to six stools per day over baseline. Grade three is an increase of over seven stools per day over baseline. And this often can result in hospitalization. And then grade four would be to where the point is light threatening. And these grades are important because it can affect how your treatment is given if you have treatment delays or reductions in treatment, and it may result in treatment changes as well. So that's kind of why this grading system exists. And then for constipation, grade one constipation is occasional or intermittent symptoms, occasional use of stool softeners, laxatives, dietary modifications, or enemas. Grade two is persistent symptoms with regular use of laxatives or enemas. Grade three is the symptoms are interfering with activities of daily living and oftentimes manual evacuation is needed. And then grade four is life-threatening consequences like obstruction and toxic megacolon. So managing it as soon as possible. Yeah. What we'll talk about is preventative strategies and this is really important to pay close attention to your bowels during treatment and even for regular health after treatment, getting your bowel function back. And the ideal is to have a bowel movement every day and keeping that in mind and don't let it go too far. That will be something that comes up over and over is like, don't let it go. Don't think that, you know, having a bowel movement every third day is normal. You really want to stay on top of this and make sure that you're doing things to prevent changes in the bowel, whatever direction, whether it's diarrhea or constipation. Right. And so the last treatment that I guess I'll mention is uh, is radiation. And this is definitely a treatment where not only during active treatment, you see the bowel changes, but they may persist for some period of time afterwards. Yes, depending on how much damage the radiation has done. A lot of times it causes diarrhea because some of the intestines, whether it's the small or the large, can be part of the radiation field. So they might not be aiming the radiation particularly at the small intestine, but if they're aiming it at the prostate or the uterus. Or the cervix, right? A lot of patients that I've seen who had treatment for, for cervical cancer have persistent bowel changes. Yeah. And if you have radiation planned, your radiation oncologist is very, very specific about what is being affected by the radiation, what is in the radiation field, the therapeutic field. You can find out what might be in the path of the radiation that's not even part of the therapy. So this is collateral damage or side effect of the radiation. So finding that out, usually you can overcome this. Um, it takes a lot of time depending on how, again, how much radiation dose an area gets will determine, you know, whether it can be completely healed and how long that'll take. And I will say that from when I first started practicing, from when I last practiced at the cancer center, I saw a lot fewer issues with diarrhea and bowel changes for patients who had radiation for prostate cancer, because just the the technology mm -hmm. changes so quickly. And so they're, you know, being able to be a lot more precise and not having the surrounding area as affected. Mm -hmm. I guess the last part on, you know, why do these changes happen is, is the cancer itself. So the tumor itself can be obstructing part of the lower digestive tract. The type of cancer can also affect, you know, I think of like carcinoid tumors mm -hmm. causing diarrhea and then, you know, adhesions following surgeries as well. Sure. Yes. 
Because the colon itself in particular uses a, a muscular contraction that pushes the food along at some point. And if you have adhesions, it can impair that. Right. It just think of it as like, you know, it's like it's like tethering the colon so it's unable to do its little undulations, its little like snaky like movements. And often that comes with spasm or a sense of pain when that's happening because it's being it's being held back. I do, you know, I just I think of it being held back. And the last thing maybe just to mention because it's inevitably going to be affected by any treatment is the microbiome, the microbiota in the gut both small intestine and large intestine, it will be affected by every treatment, regardless of what type one is getting. And it's something that we want to optimize after treatment too. So some inhabitants of the gut will cause constipation and others can make you lean towards diarrhea. But in any case, the microbiome is is on that list of things to take care of to optimize health. Definitely. So, okay, let's take a quick break and then we'll come back and talk a little bit more on medications and even supplements that can result in bowel changes. Here's a hot tip for anyone starting or changing treatments. Make sure you have some over-the-counter anti-diarrhea medications, as well as a variety of laxatives. That way you're prepared for whatever comes your way. Okay, now we're back and we're going to talk about medications as well as supplements that can contribute to changes in stool and our bowel changes. Mm -hmm. And one of the big ones, pain medications. Yeah, specifically all those opioids or... Opioids, but even like the, you know, we've got the anti-inflammatories, ibuprofen, naproxen, those can also contribute to to constipation. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, as soon as a patient is prescribed an opioid, I make sure that they, they have Miralax on hand, that they have a regimen on hand because it's inevitable. Yeah. I think that's a really important one. So any narcotic, whether it's oxycodone, oxycontin, hydrocodone, it could be in combination. So look on a label. If you see any type of opioid or narcotic, that can lead to pretty severe constipation. They always, I'm with you, always get something alongside. I favor the stimulant laxatives like Seneca with those. Yeah, and, and and combining them. I mean, and we'll get we'll get more into that. But yeah, the, the combinations of laxatives, you know, is really important. Um, Anti nausea medication. Mm-hmm. And do I have a story for you? I may have told the story before. Um, When we talked about nausea, I don't quite remember, (laughs) but like my big fear with chemotherapy was nausea. Okay. So when I was getting chemo, I was still working and I, you know, continued to work throughout treatment. So my number one fear, well, I had two big fears, nausea and diarrhea. So my oncologist gave me a certain regimen on how to take my anti-nausea medication, my Zofran. And so I was taking it as directed for the four days following treatment. And I didn't have any nausea, but I also didn't stay on top of my bowels. And I developed really bad constipation to whereas I wouldn't have a bowel movement for about a week after chemo. Mm. So... It's kind of like you you need to stay, you know, whether you're taking anti-nausea medication or pain medication, you need to stay on top of your bowels and, you know, get a regimen going. And in my mind, I was like, oh, well, I'm not having diarrhea, but I was having horrible constipation, right? which is just as bad. So, um, and I was fearful of using too much of the Miralax or whatever, because I didn't want it to shift because, you know, it can, it can change at any moment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and for some drugs out there, when you're constipated, if it's a drug that leaves through the stool normally, you can end up actually increasing the amount circulating in the bloodstream for some drugs. Right. Because drugs are metabolized and then they're eliminated either, you know, through urine or through stool. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, that was kind of a dumb move on my part, but um, I made it through, you know. But right. yeah, I probably, I probably could have like upped my Miralax and, you know, my magnesium or whatever I was taking and managed it better. So that's just a word of caution is 
stay on top of it because it's, it might not get better. You know, it might get worse. Right. And with constipation, it's better to manage it in real time than it is to wait for. Exactly. Than to wait for it to already be a problem and then try to catch up. And as it is, as we've said before, with most side effects. That's true. Yep. Good story. That's my story. That's my poo story. So let's continue with our medications. Um, Antidepressants, another one that causes bowel changes. Yes. Wait, can I just interject something here? Sure. That people may not realize that neurotransmitters that are made in our brain are also made in our gut. Mm -hmm. And that's why the gut is called our second brain. Mm -hmm. So yes, any antidepressants that you might be taking for depression, of course, can affect your gut. Because of those neurotransmitters that are also hanging out in the gut. Mm -hmm. Um, Medications like, like for diabetes. Yeah. Patients sometimes are diagnosed with diabetes along with their, you know, cancer diagnosis, or maybe they had unmanaged diabetes and suddenly it's being managed by, by their doctors. Um, but yeah, some of those medications are notorious for diarrhea Mm -hmm. and then laxatives and anti-diarrheal medications, those over the counter things, patients can be taking something that they take regularly and they don't think about it. They're taking their, you know, their Metamucil or something, and they take it all the time. And then when they start treatment, Mm -hmm. it kind of pushes them into one direction or the other, depending on what medication they they normally take just to maintain. They forget about it. I take it all the time. It's it's part of my routine. And 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 that could be causing it. So someone might be getting loose stools with their treatment, but because of a laxative that they take on a regular on a regular basis, it's pushing them into frank diarrhea. And so if they pull back on that laxative, their stool may may normalize. Yeah. And that's a good reminder going into treatment to make it really clear to your to your treatment team. If you do tend towards constipation, tend towards diarrhea, if you're taking any anything over the counter, anything natural and medications that are specifically to affect your bowels, that they know about it. Yeah. And especially the fiber supplements. And I, that brings us into to supplements. So yeah, taking a fiber supplement it may be keeping you regular on a day-to-day basis, but once you start treatment, it can send you in one direction or the other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that that's important, one direction or the other, because people will wonder, how does fiber constipate? Well, if you don't drink enough water with the fiber, it can set up. Mm-hmm. I always use the image. I mean, maybe this doesn't isn't valid for everybody, but I always use the image of when you put like concrete powder in a barrel and then you add water to it. And then if you're mixing it around, it get, it can set up and be so hard to move unless you put enough water, in which case it's it, it can move freely. Maybe not everyone can relate to that. Yeah, I, I'm not necessarily relating to that. But I do know that, yes, the issue with, with a fiber supplement would be if there is a lot of vomiting and a lot of loss of water. Plus the fact that water might taste weird. You're just not taking in enough fluids in general. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, that fiber can work against you. Yes, fiber supplements must have a lot of water alongside or else they do set up and cause constipation. So that's kind of important all the time cancer, no cancer. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that that, that's kind of yes, that's 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 fiber 101. Mm -hmm. But you forget about it when you go into treatment and everything else changes around that. Yeah. Yeah. Another really constipating supplement can be calcium. Yeah, especially the calcium carbonate, which is Tums. Yeah. So that can happen pretty easily. You can have an upset stomach and take Tums and start popping it because it helps with your upper GI stuff. And then you end up constipated because you took in so much. Because truth be told, Tums is calcium carbonate and calcium carbonate is chalk, as in chalkboards. But Tums is a lot tastier than chalk. Well, not that I've eaten chalk, but Tums are kind of tasty. Well, it's chalk with additive flavors. It's strawberry flavor or whatever's in it. Yeah. It's pink somehow. Yeah. Because, you know, Tums and I, we became friends during treatment. <laughs> <laughs> so then, and then I'm trying to think of it, if there's anything else offhand that's constipating. It's more the ones that cause diarrhea, like magnesium. Mm-hmm. Magnesium is a big one because that's something else that sometimes a patient is taking. They might be taking it just on their own. They could be taking it, you know, for hot flashes or something. And then they change treatment. They start treatment and they have this onset of 
diarrhea and you know, I'll ask, did you stop taking your magnesium? And they're like, oh no, I did not. I forgot. Um, Cause it wasn't bowel related that, you know, why they were taking it in the first place. Mm-hmm. So another one, which is kind of surprising is vitamin C. Like if somebody takes super high doses of vitamin C, which is not usually recommended during treatment. Um, but if somebody takes really high oral doses of vitamin C that can lead to, to loose stools as well. Yeah. Yeah. And magnesium and that high dose oral vitamin C can cause loose stools or diarrhea in the same way, which is uh, when you take more in your mouth than your small intestines can absorb, and that vitamin C or that magnesium makes its way all the way to the colon, it starts to hold that water that's in the colon. So it doesn't release it. So you end up loosening the stool that way, which is desirable if you're constipated. But if during treatment, you have damage to the upper intestines and that magnesium you were taking before now is not absorbed, it goes floating by your small intestine and, the, and makes it in your colon. You're going to pull water in and that water is going to lead to loose bowels. And that's true of the vitamin C too. Yeah. And on the heels of this not absorbing so well in the upper small intestine, the last one is if someone's taking fish oil or a good amount of fish oil or any oil, it doesn't have to be fish oil, it could be flaxseed oil, it could just be, you know, oil in the diet. If the small intestines are not absorbing that oil, then it will cause looser stool. Mm-hmm. You could even see fat in the toilet. Right. Kind of like fatty floating stools because it, the fat is just, it's just coming out. Yeah. And that should be reported because that's a sure sign of malabsorption. You know, definitely seeing if you can get in with an oncology trained registered dietitian to help even manage the diet to, to manage those side effects if that is available. Mm-hmm. All right. So that brings us to lifestyle causes of bowel changes. And I, we're going to kind of touch on also like why do these why do these symptoms sometimes persist after treatment ends? A specialty diet aptly named the low residue diet is sometimes prescribed to soothe the GI tract. The goal is to limit the number of residual food particles in the colon. By design, all low residue diets are low fiber. All right, so if we're going to talk about some lifestyle things that we can maintain, hydration has to be top of the list. Yeah, I mean, and we kind of touched on that before, right? With with treatment, you know, you have taste changes, and so water might taste funky. You may be nauseated, and so it's hard to keep things down. You know, there are a lot of reasons why hydration in general can go down during treatment. Yeah, maybe difficulty swallowing. Sure. For some people. I think you're right. Taste changes are probably number one of the number one reasons. Yeah, I just keep thinking about, you know, the metallic taste changes, you know, where water tastes like metal. Yeah. So, yeah, that that's the big one, right? If just finding ways of of getting that hydration in and especially and we'll go into this more in a future episode, in two episodes from now, but, you know, especially if there's a lot of water loss, if there is a lot of vomiting and there is also diarrhea, just making sure that you are maintaining that hydration. Mhm. So, yeah, that's that's a that's the big one. Yeah, and another one is lack of movement, which is common during treatment, understandably. At least at the cancer centers where I worked, it was totally encouraged, you know, go for a walk. Mm-hmm. I lived in a small town when I, I did my training and I would see patients going for walks, like because they lived, you know, in the neighborhood or they, they lived nearby and you would see them going for walks. So Walking can be this one of the simplest ways. And I like yoga. Mm-hmm. I think yoga, you know, doing a cat cow, which, you know, people can look up if they're not familiar with cat cow. And that way you really don't even have to get out of bed. You just got to like kind of get in like on your hands and knees, like in what they call tabletop position. Cat cow can even be done seated. Mm-hmm. And that kind of moves, it, it kind of moves your guts, moves your guts to move your, to move your poops. Yeah. And that, movement of the guts is due to the reflex that runs down. There's a reflex that runs down the back of our leg, down the hamstring. And when that's pulled on, it sets off an automatic involuntary reflex through the spine and to the gut. So there are nerves that communicate from your legs directly to your GI tract that tell your GI tract to go ahead and create some propulsion for the food. So, yeah. So, so finding movement and it, you know, even moving, you know, when you're in bed, just kind of like 
putting your feet on the bed, knees towards the ceiling, and just gently windshield wipering your knees back and forth, you know, kind of gives your, your lower abdomen a gentle twist. So finding ways to move can definitely help with, with constipation. Just the general change in the diet, right? So some people, you know, lose their appetite and Mm -hmm. maybe are only able to tolerate really bland kind of like those white foods. And those tend to be constipating. Um, Other people just suddenly introduce all these fruits and vegetables and fiber filled foods (laughs) to their diet and suddenly their bowels start moving faster. So it can be, it can be both. Yeah. A change in diet in any direction will change the bowels, generally speaking. Yeah. And then um, the change in routine, right? So maybe maybe there were like specific times of the day that you would go to the bathroom, but now you're going to treatment instead and you don't want to go to the bathroom at the cancer center and maybe you're at work and, you know, just any sort of change in routine or you're not at work, you know, mm-hmm. that, that definitely can affect our bowels. Yeah. And so let's move on to after treatment, because one of the things that I know you see, and I certainly see in practice is that it's understandable that all bets are off during treatment. People kind of get that and they're told about it, constipation, diarrhea, maybe it changes back and forth. And then afterwards, if there's a persistence in either or both, then it starts to get more frustrating as far as people feel a little bit like they should be back to normal by a certain time period. Right. Yeah. You hear that a lot. Oh, well, you know, since treatment, I've had these bowel changes and I mean, microbiome, that's, that's probably, Mm -hmm. you know, a huge influence as is the effect on like what we were saying on that small intestine. So Mm -hmm. a big thing that we hear is ever since treatment, I've been lactose intolerant. I could tolerate dairy before and now I can't. And that's because of the effect of those brush border enzymes in the small intestine. Yes. So I think- Thank you to advertising and media. Most people have heard of lactate, which is lactate is a lactose enzyme. It's lactase. Lactase is the enzyme that breaks down lactose. And lactase is normally made by the upper small intestine. It's a brush border enzyme made by the small intestine. And so when people go through treatment, if there's enough damage to that small intestine, then the cells themselves can no longer make lactase. And usually it's transient most of the time that recovers as the Mm -hmm. gut recovers, but it takes a lot of time. We're talking, you know, six months to a year for full recovery, if full recovery is possible, right? So it depends how much they're damaged. So if it's chemo and radiation together, they might get more damage. And you mentioned, you know, with radiation, as we mentioned before, definitely that those radiation side effects Mm -hmm. we've seen persist. Any surgeries that, as we mentioned before, that affect the bowels, you know, that that's a permanent change. And then even for people who have had surgeries to their, their small intestine, there's the short bowel syndrome Mm -hmm. where, um, you know, they find that certain things, you know, like maybe even foods high in sugar kind of trigger. And then the hormonal changes that can happen with therapies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a lot after treatment that needs to kind of be teased out as far as causation and then tackle that. Because even with surgery, let's say somebody has half of their colon removed, then the stools will become looser and how to manage that and how to make up for it. I mean, that's it. It's, some people can recover from that and that half of a colon can become more efficient in absorbing water. And other times we have to manage it and find ways of managing the stool. Right. All right. So that's a quick little primer on the bowel changes. So. Uh, That brings us, Leia, to our song. For our episode on bowel changes, our song is Changes by David Bowie. This is our unofficial theme song for this episode. This is the ch-ch-ch-ch-changes. Exactly. (laughs) Has nothing to do with poop, but it's about changes. And that is what we are talking about today. And I have to say, I feel like I'm holding myself back because there's so much information that I want to give. But we've got two more episodes coming up, our next one being constipation. Oh, and we have a good song for that one. But before you go, I want to thank everybody for listening. If you got something to say, I love the comments on Instagram, but you know, go on to where you listened to the podcast and leave us a comment. Yeah, it really helps us out, actually. And that way, when other people look at us, they know uh, 
what we're about. So what you like, what you didn't like, and uh, pass it around. And we really do appreciate every listener. And I do want to add, um, we have not mentioned this. We actually have a buy me a coffee. Mm -hmm. That helps for us to to keep doing what we're doing um, so that we can pay for a producer and an editor and, you know, a social media person. If you like what you hear, buy us a coffee. <laughs> Let's all have coffee someday. We'll all have coffee together. <laughs> and in our next episodes, we will be discussing a little bit of coffee. That's true. Coffee will come up as a topic. Mm -hmm. We have a whole episode on it in the past for those who don't know, but... We try to bring it up into as many episodes as we can. We try to talk about coffee as often as possible. All right. So on that note, I'm Dr. Leah Sherman. And I'm Dr. Tina Kayser. And this is The Cancer Pod. Until next time. Thanks for listening to The Cancer Pod. Remember to subscribe, review, and rate us wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on social media for updates. And as always, this is not medical advice. These are our opinions. Talk to your doctor before changing anything related to your treatment plan. The Cancer Pod is hosted by me, Dr. Leah Sherman, and by Dr. Tina Kayser. Music is by Kevin McLeod. See you next time. <laughs>